right, looks like we are good to go. Hey guys, it's Bart Johnson here, and once again, it is Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, which means it's time for us to go live, hang out, check out gear, talk, all that fun stuff. Um, so, <clears throat> without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get today's show started. Originally for today, um, if you guys are subscribers to the channel, you would know this. If you're not, make sure to go ahead and subscribe down below so you can get all my notifications. But originally, uh, I had a different show planned for today. We were going to take a look at uh, some 360 video editing workflows and stuff like that. Now, we're still going to do that show. I've pushed it back until next week um, because, obviously, something really cool and exciting happened. Um, I had something awesome come in the mail yesterday, um, and we are going to take a look at them today. I purchased um, my very first set of what I call true uh, cinema prime lenses, um, and uh, this is something I've been wanting for a long time. I think is really going to step up the quality of my production with my company, and uh, so we're going to take a look at these today. We're going to talk about cinema primes and cinema lenses and what makes them different, what makes them more expensive, um, and what some of the benefits are, and we'll also um, talk about why I decided to, one, purchase instead of rent, and two, why I decided to purchase this particular set right here. Um, so before we get into that, just a little bit of housekeeping stuff. Um, I do want to let you guys know that, of course, this is a live show. So if you are tuning in and joining me live, the beauty of that is that we get to hang out, discuss, ask questions, and all sorts of stuff like that throughout the show. And so I have the ability to pull us up on the screen here for our chat. There we go. I see we've already got a few people in here. We've got uh, my buddy Aaron from uh, New Legend Pictures um, asking if I'm shooting this video on the Xenons. I am not. I am still using my, uh, my former cine lenses, and we'll talk about that a little bit later because um, I've got all these guys in their boxes, and we're going to take them out today and take a look. Um, and we've also got Kyle Markham in here saying, hey, welcome, Kyle. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be taking a look at these lenses. Uh, if you guys have any questions along the way about either these lenses or cinema lenses or anything like that, please do pop it into the chat um, and feel free to have discussions and hang out. That's the beauty of live shows. Um, and I do have a note down there at the bottom, uh, like down here. Um, if I'm in the middle of it, a good way to get my attention, because I do have the chat pulled up beside me, but a good way to catch my eye and get my attention if you have a direct question for me is just do the, uh, the at symbol and tag me there, at Bart Johnson Productions, and it'll pop up, and I'll make sure that I see your comment, just because sometimes I get a little lost. But anyway, uh, without further ado, guys, these right here, let me pull one over. These are the Cinema Prime lenses that I have just picked up. They just came in yesterday. Um, now, of course, I did not have the self-control to not open these and check them out already, but for you guys, I put them back in the boxes and we're gonna do a little unboxing of them to take a peek. Um, we'll blaze through that because unboxings are pretty darn boring. Um, and to be honest, maybe we'll just focus on opening up one or two because really they're all the same inside, uh, different focal lengths, but I mean the packaging is the same. So let's go ahead and I'll get this guy set up. Let me switch us over to our overhead camera here. Uh, these guys have some big old boxes, so I'm going to move these out of the way so we have a little bit of room here. So uh, let me show you guys what we're looking at here. Um, I picked up the uh, Schneider Xenon FF, which is full frame prime lens kit. Uh, I picked this up used. Um, I was able to find a guy who uh, was able to work out a great deal. Um, got a great deal on these. I have the 25 millimeter, there's a 35, a 50, a 75, and a 100 millimeter. They also make an 18, but the 18 is a lot more expensive. So maybe sometime down the road, I'll pick that up. But for right now, I got the primary five lenses in this kit. Um, and let's just go ahead, so you can see they are a T2.1, um, so they're in T-stops instead of F-stops, and I'll mention that a little bit later in case we don't know what that is. Um, and they are 95 millimeter for filter thread, so not the biggest, because um, there's like 114s and stuff with like the Canons, uh, but they're still bigger than your usual lenses. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead, pop this guy open here. And there she is inside there. So let's go ahead and pull this foam out. 
Get that out of the way. I know it's a little hard to see in here because the light's not hitting her. But here we go. We will get her out and onto the table here. And let me switch over to our second camera so that you can see here. So here we go, guys. This is the 25 millimeter Xenon FF, so full frame prime lens from Schneider. Um, so it is a big lens, it is a hefty lens, not as heavy as uh, some other ones out there, which is one of the reasons why I decided to pick up this kit. But we're gonna take a look at, uh, at these lenses so that you can see why a cinema lens is different from DSLR lenses or other lenses that are out there. Let me take a quick peek back at the chat real quick because I see we've got a lot of people hanging out in here, which is awesome. Uh, my buddy DL saying, let me know when, uh, when you need help testing those out. Yeah, I am, uh, I am itching to go out and start shooting some stuff. I might even do some later on today uh, with these guys. Um, uh, and New Legend Pictures is asking, you have a remote? Yes, I have a remote that I use to do my switching down here because uh, I have kind of an interesting live stream setup down here. It's not like a, a normal switcher type deal, but I managed to make it work. Um, Trevor's in here, good to see you, says, I've been a fan of Schneider for quite a long time. Um, I had an old Rolofex twin lens camera that had uh, the Krejnach lens. Yeah, I can't even try and pronounce that. That's why I'm just saying the first half of the company name, Schneider, because I can say that one. Um, I know I'll butcher the other. Um, and then uh, you say, I love these lenses. The first time I saw footage from them was at a, a shoot with Zebo. So Zebo is a good friend of ours. My buddy Aaron is mentioning him. Actually, yeah, it was Zebo's set uh, that I first used as well, using these on a red for a production. And I kind of fell in love with them. And that was several years ago. So I have been waiting, waiting a long time to get my hands on these lenses. And I can't believe that I actually have a set of them now, which is, it just feels amazing. Um, and Trevor is saying they're smaller than I thought. So that's one of the things that I like about these guys is that they are full frame. Um, they are decently fast at T2.1, um, but they are not as massive as some other cinema lenses out there, like the Canon CNEs and the Zeiss CP2s and stuff like that. I know we're kind of skipping ahead as to why I chose these lenses, um, but yeah, they're very manageable size, very manageable weight. Um, and. Uh, and I like them a lot. And of course, optics and image quality is a huge thing. I'm a real big fan of the way that these look, which is really um, what matters the most. So very happy to have this set of lenses. So what I'm gonna do uh, to demonstrate for you guys a few of the things that make cinema lenses special is I'm gonna open up another one of these guys here. So we've got our 25. And this was great. The guy I picked these up used from um, He's taken immaculate care of them, all in their still, uh, you know, they have their original packaging and all that stuff, and they're in really, really good shape, which is something you definitely want to look for. Lenses retain their value very, very well, but, you know, some things can have dust inside them or be scraped up, and these were all really well taken care of, and I'm really happy about that. Uh, let me get that down out of the way. Let's see, who else should we open here? Let's, uh, let's open our 75. We'll go to the other end of the focal range there. So here we go. Let's go to our top down here. Like I said, unboxings are boring, guys, so I'm just going to try and tear right through this as fast as possible and get into the fun stuff. So again, T2.1, 75 millimeter. Um, you know, a lot of times you see 85 millimeter. I know my old set of primes, 85 was the go-to, uh, but for this set, 75 is the focal length that they choose. So I'll get used to shooting 75 millimeter. Not gonna be a problem. Uh, but yeah, open it up. As you can see, pretty much identical to the last one. Let's pull this top foam out. And let's get her out as well. There she is. Let me get this foam back in the box and get this out of the way. Try not to beat up the box in case I ever need to uh, ship them in them in the future. Uh, but here we go. Here is the 75 millimeter. Uh, let me switch to our other camera angle. This is our 75 millimeter of the, uh, the Schneider uh, Xenon Prime. 
And here is the 25, sort of the other end of the, uh, the focal range. And this is one of the first things that I wanted to show you. All of these lenses, as you'll find with uh, sets of Cinema Prime lenses, all of them are identical in size. So we can pull these lens caps off. And while the actual optical elements inside are different sizes, you can see that the, the thread for any filters, if you do screw on filters, and also the outer barrel diameter are identical. And that's important for cinema lenses. So you can also see that their height is identical. And so by having them all be uniform, this means that when you are in a, a cinema environment shooting with a matte box or something like that, or follow focuses and all of that, um, that Anytime you do a lens swap, these are going to be the exact same size. So if your matte box, you have an opening that you set up, so these are 100 millimeters around the barrel here. So 100 millimeters, you pull that matte box off, you switch to the other lens, it goes right on there. You don't have to change any bits of your kit. It's 100 millimeters here, it's 100 millimeters here. Then of course, if you go to do a lens swap and you have a follow focus or something on there, your gears for both focus and iris are at exactly the same levels on all of these lenses. So these are pretty far apart focal length wise. So this is a 75 and this is the 25, but they have these gears and the important thing is that they are at exactly the same point. So if I'm swapping stuff out and I have a rig built up with my camera, all I have to do is switch the lens, swing the follow focus back into place, put my matte box back on or swing it back into place, and everything is going to be perfectly lined up and perfectly sized because everything is uniform in terms of the body across these lenses. So that's something you're going to find with um, any lenses that really call themselves cinema lenses, and especially a cinema lens set, you're usually going to find that across the board. Uh, I'm probably getting ahead of myself here. Let me check my notes. But uh, that's one of the biggest things, and it allows you to work a lot faster when you're doing lens swaps with like a big rig or something like that, where you do have all of these attachments and things that are controlling and modifying your lens. Uh, so there we go. Um, before I pop into the chat, one thing um, else that makes these lenses unique, cinema lenses, is the fact that they have these gears built in at all. So these gears, uh, again, there's one set of gears on focus, and there's another set of gears on iris. Most commonly, you use focus, or at least I do, because I don't have multiple motors. Uh, but this allows you to attach a, uh, a follow focus gear, and its teeth will sync perfectly with this. Uh, it is a standard 0 0.08 or 0.8 pitch gear. Um, and so it'll sync perfectly with that. And so you're able to, by using your follow focus, the gear will then turn and turn your focus. Or if you have one on your iris, it'll turn your iris. Now, this is something that DSLR lenses particularly do not have. But of course, there are solutions that people use all the time where you can get those little zip gear attachments or various things that you can put on there to put gear teeth onto your lenses. With cinema lenses, those are going to be built in. They're part of the body. You don't have to worry about attaching anything else. You don't have to worry about it falling out of place. It's just there. These are built to be connected to external things like follow focuses and controlled. So let's take a peek at the chat here. I know you guys are going, keeping it busy in here. Um, let's see here. New Legend Picture said, uh, do they actually have a filter thread? Yes, so these do actually have a filter thread. And what he means by that is, um, if there is a thread to do screw on filters, because usually sometimes with cinema lenses, um, they need a matte box or something to put filters in front of them. This set does have a 95 millimeter filter thread. Let me see if I can show you that here. So inside here, um, there is threading inside here on all of the lenses, just along the outside. So a 95 millimeter filter can go and can screw right on there. And I did pick up some because I don't own a matte box system right now. I may in the future, but for right now, um, I'm going to thread on my ND, uh, variable ND filters and stuff like that, um, just for the time being. But yes, they all do have uniform filter sizes. Like I said, uniform outer by, or barrel diameter and uniform filter sizes across this entire set. 
Um, and you're going to find that with any set of true Cinema Prime lenses. You know, they may not be 95 millimeter, they may be larger, usually the standard's about 114 millimeters, but or 110 millimeters, but they're going to be the same across all of the lenses in the set. Okay, let's see if we got anything else in the chat here. Um, Trevor's talking about how do you feel about the integrated collar? Um, he's talking about, are you talking about the, the mount, the mount collar down here? Um, let me know if that's exactly what you're talking about. Um, and then also, isn't the industry standard for matte boxes 105 millimeters? So what I've found by looking uh, in terms of matte boxes with their openings, the standard, standard being the one that seems to be most commonly used is 114. So 114 millimeters is the outer di diameter of like the Zeiss CP2s, uh, the Canon CNE lenses, I believe even the knockoff, or not knockoff, but cheapo Zine um, cinema lenses, uh, those are all 114 millimeters. So these are a little bit smaller if I wanted to put a map box on there, but there are systems, I was looking at a bright tangerine map box, um, and they do have adapters that go down to the 100 millimeter um, diameter on the outside here. So it's just a simple thing that I thread into the back of the matte box, leave it in there, and then it'll go perfectly onto the front of these. Um, so while these are not the most common industry standard size, they're smaller, and I actually like that. Um, 114 is the one that you find kind of most commonly. Um, most of the big name cinema lenses uh, use 114, at least from what I've found by looking it up. Um, uh, let's see, 157 Pictures, uh, what kind of mount do they come with? Is the mount adjustable? Man, you guys are just taking care of all sorts of stuff for me here. So these particular ones that I have, I got them with uh, an EF mount. So EF is the type of lens mount that I use most commonly. I use, I have my Ursa Mini, which is EF mount. So these will go natively onto that. That's what's filming me right there. I also have my GH5, but I do use a speed booster for the GH5 converting to EF. So I find EF to be the most versatile uh, lens mount for me. Um, now pro level stuff, pro level is usually what you call PL mount. Now, these are, these do have swappable mounts at the back. Let me go ahead and cover these and I'll show you at the back one of the mounts. So if we flip this guy over here, as you can see right here, let me take this back cap off. I do have an EF mount on here. So this will go natively onto any of my EF mounts or my speed booster. Um, but these lenses in particular, they are swappable and they are even user swappable. And I was able to get uh, with this whole deal with all these lenses, I also have PL mounts for each of these lenses. So if in the future I do rent a camera that is PL mounts, you know, something like an Aerie or something like that, um, I can then remove these and put the PL mounts on there. There's a little bit of shimming and stuff you need to do to make sure everything's aligned and proper distance from the sensor, but not too difficult, but I do have those as well. So those are usually the mounts that you'll find for cinema lenses. Um, you'll see PL mount quite a bit because it really is like Hollywood industry standard, those bigger, higher end cameras. Um, but EF is also, you can usually find EF mount for all of those as well, the majority of them. Um, some high-end, you know, airy lenses and stuff like that, you're not going to find any of that. Um, but a lot of manufacturers have embraced EF mount as being uh, one of the more versatile mounting solutions in that you can usually adapt that. Even if you don't have something that's native, you can adapt EF to something else. Like with Sony, um, with their E-mount, you know, you could get a speed booster or even a dumb adapter um, to extend that, or extend that flange space, and then you can, uh, you can put an EF lens on that as well. So EF is a pretty versatile uh, mounting option, and it's what I have, so I went with EF. Um, let's see, uh, and Trevor says, yes, I mean the collar on the lens barrel. So, let me show you guys exactly what Trevor is asking about here. So Trevor is asking about this right here. So what this is, and you'll find this on a lot of cinema lenses as well, especially heavier ones, since these are full metal, there's no plastic anywhere to be found except for the, you know, the front and back caps. 
Um, while these aren't the heaviest lenses in the world, they definitely have some serious heft to it, which can put some strain on your mount when you attach it to the camera. So a lot of times you'll put some additional lens support. So this would be coming down off the bottom and you would screw something into this off of your rig, maybe some rails or something to help and support this so that not all of the weight is on the, uh, the lens mount itself. And with these, it comes attached. And it's not actually a collar here, if you see. It actually does have two screws, so if I wanted to, I could pull this piece off. But to be honest, they really don't jut out that far. If you look, it really is just about flush with uh, the outer diameter up at the top where the lens is its thickest. So I don't mind these being on here. I see no reason for me to take these off. And then they're always there if I am in a situation where I'm like, okay, I really wanna make sure I do some extra support. There's a quarter 20 thread right in the middle. So any supports that you have on your rig, you can attach right there. And of course, all of these lenses have them and all of them have them in the exact same location so that when you twist lock these into the mount, this is perfectly facing down. There's nothing to like loosen and swivel around and line up. These are always facing directly down in the direction that you need when the lens is clicked and locked into place. So uh, for these, I really like that. And again, you'll find this with a lot of cinema lenses. Sometimes they have a separate attachment piece that you can then put on there. Um, but these uh, already have them attached, but they are removable if I wanted to, but I don't really see the need to. Um, okay, so we've made it through the chat there. Um, I wanna keep talking about cinema lenses because obviously beyond, beyond their build, um, beyond the housing, the body of it, obviously there's gotta be something else to their much higher price than uh, DSLR lenses. Most DSLR lenses, I mean, some can get pretty high. Um, but also what I call sort of like not true or almost like faux cinema lenses. Um, and obviously that's gonna be in the optics. So the optics are where a lot of your cost is because you can of course do something like what Zine did and take Rokinon lenses, the optics, and just rehouse them in a cinema housing so they're all hefty and big and have gears um, and, uh, and, and you know, are basically look and feel like cinema lenses, but the optics are the same. Now these are some beautiful, beautiful optics in terms of their, uh, their color. Uh, I find them not to be too warm, not too cool. They're actually kind of right down the middle so that I can take my image however I want to go with it. They are super sharp. Um, they're capable of covering up to 6K. So that means like shooting up to 6K, they're rated for that. Obviously we have 8K and stuff like that now. And they will of course do fine there as well unless you're super pixel peep peeping but super sharp, super crisp. Um, and then one of the other big things is focus breathing. So what focus breathing is, is if you have a lens <clears throat> and it's at a set focal length, say you have a 35 millimeter and you focus as close as you can and you look at the edges of your frame and then you shift your focus to infinity, you may see that your, your frame actually shifts either bigger or smaller. So you're actually getting a slight difference in focal length depending on the focus and that's called focus breathing. You don't want in the middle of a shot if you do like a rack focus or something like that you don't want your frame to noticeably change in size and some lenses are far worse at this than others. Um, to be honest the Sigmas the 18 to 35 and the I think it's like a 50 to 100 or something um, which they have cinema housed versions of them, um, they breathe horribly. Um, like there is a big noticeable difference when you shift the focus on those lenses. With these, it is minimal to none whatsoever. Um, to the point where you would have to seriously be looking for it to notice any slight shift. Um, and all of that is in the precision that goes into the optics, that goes into the engineering um, and just, you know, it's that whole thing where you get to a point where it costs exponentially more to get exponentially smaller improvements. Um, but you know that's something that's important for cinematic shooting, um, for you know cinema shooting, and focus breathing is is 
absolutely next to none on these. Um, and that's what you're going to find with a lot of the other high-end cinema lenses as well. Um, you know, focus breathing is pretty much non-existent, and it's a big engineering feat uh, to get that kind of precision with the elements moving inside uh, to make sure that that happens, and that's part of why these cost so much more. The other thing is that, again, I said these are a set, and there's a lot of sets out there. What happens is these lenses are all color matched to one another. So that means that you're not going to have one that skews a little green, one that skews a little warm, one that skews a little cool. They are all optically color matched to each other so that you can seamlessly swap between them and each of your shots are going to have the exact same look. Um, and so that's something that obviously is important if you're shooting a scene. You don't want to have to worry about color shift like, ah, oh, the 25 doesn't look as good. Let's go for another one. Um, so matched, uh, matched optics in terms of colors, in terms of quality, all of that you're going to find in cinema lenses. Uh, let's see what we got here. Doo, doo, doo. Trevor says, uh, even the CP2s are rehoused photo lenses. Uh, so are the Sigma cine glass as well. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about rehousing um, uh, lenses and, and all of that and why I'm not really a fan of it. I mean, obviously, a lot of them are more affordable um, than these particular ones or even higher end ones than these. Um, Rehousing and not changing the optics kind of seems like a waste of money to me. Um, it's like if you took your Honda and put it in a, a Ferrari body and it still drives like a Honda. Um, it just looks like a Ferrari. Yeah, it may have some different you know, functions and stuff like that, but the core of what matters, I mean, your viewers are not going to see your beautifully rehoused lens and what it looks like or how easy it was for you to attach focus gears and stuff to it um, or focus motors, what they see is the image that comes out of it. So if your money isn't going towards improving optics, I don't see the point. Um, and while Sigma, their art series, are very good lenses to start, I don't understand well, I understand, but I don't have the desire to spend extra money to get those same optics in a housing that makes them cinema lenses, if that makes sense. Um, which is why I call these true cinema lenses, because these were built and designed from the ground up as cinema lenses. These are not optics borrowed from anything else. These were purpose built as cinema lenses, cinema level optics cinema level precision um, and you're going to find the same thing with the canons um, and as you go higher up of course into like Aries and Cooks and all sorts of stuff like that that's what you're going to find. I did not know that about the Zeiss CP2s though that's very interesting uh, to know that optically they're the same as some of their uh, their stills lenses um, but then again Zeiss stills lenses are still some of the most primo of optics, so maybe in their case it's forgivable. Uh, but something like Sigma, um, I don't know. I'd want to get more for my money other than just a housing, but that's just me. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right. So another thing I wanted to mention about cinema lenses Sorry, i got to open my phone here and make sure I'm hitting everything. Yep, did that, did that. So I talked a bit about focus and focus breathing and the focus gears that make cinema lenses unique. Well, there's another thing that makes cinema lenses unique specifically over um, DSLR or photo and stills lenses. And that's going to be the focus throw. Now, the focus throw is how far you rotate, let's do this one, is how far you rotate your focus ring to go from farthest to closest. Let me see, where's one of my markers? There we go, we've got a marker right here. Uh, so with DSLRs, sometimes it can be very short. You know, it's like, oh, there's the farthest, there's the closest. Now that's fine for still shooting because you, you only need to focus on the object once you get there, hit it, take your shot, and you're good to go. But if you need to shift focus for video while things are actively happening, you want to have finer granularity of control. And so these have a 300 degree focus turn. So here's minimum, 
and we're going to go still rotating, still rotating, still rotating, boom, there's infinity. So 300 degrees of rotation. And what this means is that you have much finer control of your distances in between because they're spread out along a longer rotation. So if we go down to the, uh, the bottom end of this here, I think you guys can see the markings. So even here, I mean, what are we at? We got 12 inches, 14 inches. So that just shifted my focal plane two inches. Another two inches, another two inches, another two inches, another two inches, another two inches to two feet. Okay, so now we start jumping up. And you get the point. I mean, as you get higher, it obviously ramps up and starts going further, gets into feet, jumping along by, you know, two feet, 10 feet, all the way up until you get to infinity. But that focus throw, that long distance of travel for your focus is going to mean that you have a lot finer control, and that's not something you get on DSLR lenses. Another thing that you sometimes won't get on DSLR, DSLR lenses is uh, what they call hard stops. So if we take a look at this, as you saw when I did that, this lens hits infinity and it stops. There's a hard metal stop in there, not allowing me to rotate any further. The same is at the minimum. So if I go all the way to the minimum, boop, there's a hard stop there. Now what this means and why this is important is DSLR lenses, sometimes you can hit infinity and then you can keep going until you start rotating back and then it catches again and there you go. Um, the problem with that is if you're using a, a, a follow focus, especially a wireless one with a motor or something like that, it will calibrate to your start and stop points. But if that allows you to continue rotating, your marks and your, your calibrated points no longer mean anything. They're tossed out the window. So hard stops are important, uh, especially when using follow focuses and stuff like that. If you mark your points, you don't want it to be able to go beyond because all of a sudden your focus mark is no longer any good and you have to recalibrate or remark it with a grease pencil or something like that. So that's another detail that makes these very oriented towards um, you know, a cinema type environment, uh, shooting with uh, you know, a first AC, someone pulling focus, um, and all of that. DSLR lenses are fantastic for what they do, but honestly they were not originally intended to be video lenses, so they don't have some of those handy focusing features like the long throw, like hard stops, um, and all of that. Again, they work perfectly fine and we get some amazing images out of what is essentially stills glass, uh, but cinema lenses are designed for cinema um, and, uh, and they do their job very, very well. All right, let's take a peek at our chat. Let's see what we got here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Trevor saying, uh, since I'm shooting only on a crop sensor for video, I opted to buy the, uh, the Vedra, which are probably a third the size of these. Um, also no breathing. Yeah, so Vedra was a company, unfortunately, I believe they're out of business, they're gone, um, that made cinema prime lenses for smaller sensor cameras, um, particularly Micro Four Thirds, and I think they even had a few for Super 35. Um, and they were great because smaller sensor means you don't need glass that's as large, so you can make the whole thing smaller, not as heavy. Um, and so they were great lenses. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure what happened to Vedra, but they seem to have disappeared, um, which is a shame. Um, and uh, the Forge Studios is in here. Good to see you guys. Thanks for joining. Um, so one thing that I do also want to address which I mentioned earlier, is this. Let me get this guy out of here. So, wait, I want that one. I'm getting confused. I moved this guy out of the way. Uh, is this marking right here. As you can see, this says T, not F. So T stops instead of F stops. Um, and these are T 2.1 all the way to T 22. But what a T-stop is compared to an F-stop, they are both measurements of uh, light, or one is a calculation, one's a measurement. But basically, they're supposed to tell you how much light the, 
lens is letting through it, right? So what an f-stop is, an f-stop is actually a mathematical calculation. It's calculating the size uh, of the iris opening at those different points versus the distance or focal length of the lens. And it's using that calculation to tell you, okay, that's how much light should be coming out the back of this, f5.6 or something, say like that. So it's a calculation, but it doesn't, it's not always perfect. So what that means is that there could be a little bit of light loss. There could be light bouncing around and getting lost in some of the elements in here. And so you may not actually have that amount of light coming out the back of the lens when it goes to hit the sensor. And so what they found back in, uh, back in the film days, because again, we're talking cinema, is that sometimes they would have a lens if they were rated in f-stops and they would put it on and they'd be shooting a scene and then they would grab another lens and set it to the exact same f-stop that they had their previous lens at, do a swap, but the image would look different. Maybe it was a little bit brighter, maybe it was a little bit darker, but something was different. And for cinema, they need to have those match. They need it to be exactly. So what a T-stop is and what they came up with is a T-stop is actually a physical measurement of the actual amount of light that is coming out of the back of this lens. So that means that if I set this lens to T2.1 and I set another one to T2.1, I'm getting T2.1 is the same exact amount of light coming out the back of each of these lenses. And it's the same with any lenses in this cinema set or any lenses even that are rated in T-stops as opposed to F-stops. F-stops are a calculation and could be slightly incorrect. I mean, they're usually not like off by multiple stops or anything like that, but they're not a, an actual measurement, while a T-stop is an actual measurement of the light transmission, T for transmission, coming out of the back of that lens. So what it says is what you get, and that's why um, cinema lenses are so perfectly engineered uh, and precisely engineered to make sure that the light coming out is exactly what it says and it's going to be the same for every single lens across this kit and potentially and I believe the same even if you match a T 2.1 or T whatever from another kit because it's a measurement not a calculation so there you go there's your uh, the more you know moment for today <laughs> um, let's see what we got here so uh, the Forge Studios is asking, not sure if you answered it, uh, but how much weight is uh, that adding to the setup? So <clears throat> I'm not actually sure of the exact weight of these lenses. Um, I'm sure it says on like B&H or something like that. They do have some heft because they're all metal. They are full frame coverage, so there's a good bit of glass in here. Um, but they're not super heavy. It will add a good bit of weight, uh, maybe maybe a pound or two more than my usual lenses, um, but it's not a huge amount, which is why I actually went with these because they are on the smaller side for cinema lenses in terms of their, their size and their weight, while some other lenses are much bulkier and much heavier. Um, and other cinema lenses may be like a T1.5, be a little bit faster, while these are T2.1, but that requires them to be bigger, have more glass elements, have larger glass elements, more weight, um, and larger size. So I'm very happy with this right here. And T2.1 is gonna be more than enough for me. These are going to be fantastic. Now one thing that I have been talking about is I've mentioned various times my old lenses. So let me get this is the 75. So this is the 75 millimeter. Now let me show you guys a near equivalent lens of what I have been using. And this guy's right here. So this is a Rokinon Cine DS uh, cinema lens. And cinema I'm putting in quotes because this is an example, um, a low-end example, because they're very affordable. They have been great quality for the price, um, but it is their photo lenses that they ended up rehousing, adding gears, and across this entire set, because I have a full set of these, they have all the gears matching. 
um, and, and at the exact same spot. They weren't able to make them all the same size. But as you can see here, this is an 85 millimeter, so they're not exactly the same. And this is a 75 millimeter. Um, but this is obviously a lot smaller. They're both full frame coverage. They're both EF mount, uh, but you can see the difference. So they are going to be larger, uh, heavier. This is all plastic. This is all metal, um, but yeah. So that's how they compare there. Let me show you another example. We'll swap this guy out for the 25 millimeter and let me grab its closest equivalent. These will be a little bit closer, but you'll see this is the 24 millimeter Rokinon. So we have a 25 and a 24. Again, both full frame coverage, um, but this is sort of a faux cine lens, if you will. You know, they added the gears um, both for the iris and for the focus, but this one's all plastic, this one's all metal. Um, and these optics are photo optics that are in here. There have been no improvements or anything like that. And actually, these optics that are in this are exactly the same optics that are in the Zine lenses. So they went even one step further. They took their stills lenses, put them in a plastic cinema housing for these Rokinon Cine DS lenses, um, and then they went one step farther, took the exact same optics and put them in a larger true cinema housing um, and those became the zines. So the reason I didn't go for the zines is because I would be getting exactly the same optical quality that I've been getting with these guys, which they are fairly good. They do tend to skew a little bit towards the green um, and some of them, especially the 35 millimeter that I have, have huge focus breathing issues, chromatic aberration issues, and stuff like that. But again, you're looking at something that, you know, six to $800 for something like this versus a lot more. I think this guy is about $4,000. Actually, this one's even higher. This one's about $5,000 brand new. Um, so there is a reason and there is a difference there. Now, I'm not saying goodbye to my Rokinons because I will always need uh, some backups and all that, but I am very happy to have, like I said, what I call a true cinema lens kit now um, with the Schneiders. Let me put uh, this guy away after trash talking him so much. They've been so good to me for so many years and now I just, you know, trash talk them, but they really are decent lenses. I mean, they're not perfect. Of course, they're not going to be for such a, you know, a low price relatively low compared to other stuff, um, but they have done me very, very well and I've used these guys for years and I've got the whole set and like I said, I'm not getting rid of them yet. They will still stay in my arsenal. Let me put these guys away and then we'll check on the chat here um, and see what we got going on. Let me get this guy back out here. Um, let's see here. Trevor's saying about a year ago, 80% of Vedra's inventory was stolen. I remember seeing that. Um, they've been struggling to recover the drop in supply, but should be coming back soon. Oh, okay, so hopefully that'd be good. Trevor says, aperture doesn't mean anything in terms of light transmission. It's very misleading. Your f1.4 lens may be as slow as another f2.8 lens. I think everyone should switch over to T-stops. Yeah, so, yeah, you're correct. You said, I, was, I had to think through that. You're right. F-stop, so F-stops, your aperture in F-stops doesn't, um, necessarily mean that is your actual light transmission. You're right, which is why T-stops are better because T-stops are a true measurement of light transmission coming out the back of that lens. Um, and so you're right, you know, you could have um, two lenses that say different F-stops, but they are actually end up letting the same amount of light through because maybe one is losing some light somewhere along the way in the housing, um, which is natural, you know, that's gonna happen, but Cinema lenses take that into account and make sure that they make adjustments so that, you know, a T-stop on this one is exactly the same as a T-stop on this one, which is great. <clears throat> so the last thing that I want to talk to you guys about is um, why I chose to purchase cinema lenses. Um, because it wasn't cheap, it's a large investment, um, and also why I chose to go with this particular set of lenses. Um, so I'll talk about that while I'm getting the rest of these out so we can kind of show them off. So, so here we go. So 
I had been, of course, I, I have my own company. I, um, I do a lot of shoots. And we have been starting to do some very, very high-end stuff. Um, and it got to the point where I was considering renting cinema lenses on a per shoot basis um, because you know because of the huge price you can usually rent lenses at a much more affordable price bill it through to a client or something like that and it's fine and then just return them when the job is done however um, with the stuff I've got going on now it was looking like they would be I'd be renting them far more often than I thought um, so I'd be renting them at least once a month um, and at that point, it kind of came to me that, you know what, this actually makes sense as something to invest in rather than rent every single time because um, I'm going to get use out of them and I'm going to get use out of them almost right away. So that may not be the right decision for everybody. Um, and for a lot of people, it won't be. Obviously, rental houses are out there for a reason. Um, and so renting is a very viable option. But for me, it made sense to have these in-house on hand um, and to, uh, to have them be part of our kit. The other good thing is that lenses are a very solid investment because while camera technology will change and cameras will be obsolete and out of date so quickly, you know, uh, sometimes it's as little as six months before the newer model of a camera or something comes out and you're like, well, great, the value of my camera has just decreased so much. Lenses, good lenses, high quality lenses retain their value very, very well. So not saying that I'm already thinking about selling these because I'm hoping these guys are going to be with me for a decade plus, um, you know, taking good care of them and using them. Um, they're going to perform perfectly for me every single time and they're going to retain their value. They really are a true investment. Um, and so glass is a really good thing to invest in. And it took, uh, it took a big push, uh, you know, to, to push myself to take the leap to invest in these because it was not cheap. Um, I got a fantastic deal, uh, but brand new. I mean, these are about $20,000 worth of lenses. Um, I got a fantastic deal and didn't pay anywhere near that because I went used. Um, but, you know, that's something to consider that it is a large cost to jump up to this, which is why renting is the way to go for a lot of people. Uh, the reason that I went with these particular lenses, uh, I've mentioned it a little bit, is that I have used them before. I really like the look of, uh, of their optics. And I really, really like, uh, we get the 25, we'll get him hanging out over here too. I like their look, I like their color temperature, um, but I also like their size and I like their weight. They are full frame coverage, so while most of my cameras right now are Super 35 or actually with the GH5 even smaller, I have the ability that if, uh, if I rent, uh, you know, uh, a full frame red or something like that, these guys will go on there and will work. So they will cover full frame sensors. That was important to me. They are smaller and a little bit lighter than most traditional uh, cinema lenses, uh, but they are equally as capable, you know, maybe not as fast in the T-stops being at 2.1, but to be honest, if I, I'm usually shooting at like a 2.8 or higher, so these are perfect uh, for me and I'm very happy with them. And like I said, I had the experience of using these before, so I didn't just blindly go into it. And that's something you should always do, even if you are looking to purchase. Make sure you rent some first or find someone who has some so that you actually get hands on and get to use them. Um, because the only way you're going to know if they work for you, if you like the look and the feel and the, the workflow is to go out. And this is true for any gear, not just lenses, is to get your hands on them and use them. Yeah, it might cost you couple hundred bucks to, to rent a set or something like that. But in the end, it's going to be really worth it because what if you find that you don't like them? Um, you just saved yourself a big, <laughs> a big investment in something that isn't quite right for you. So uh, I do encourage, of course, renting whenever you can. Let's see what we got here, guys. <laughs> uh, Trevor is asking me, so in terms of rendering, where are these lenses? Cool, warm, neutral. So these guys, 
tend to be neutral with a slight skew towards cool. So Zeiss, uh, the CP2s are very on the cool side usually. They have a very kind of bluish overall look to them I find. Um, they're not anywhere near as cool as that. They're very much more middle of the road neutral. Um, and Canons tend to be a little bit on the warmer side. Uh, I do love the Canon look, but um, I really, you know, I can achieve that look. If I want to warm things up, I, I can do that with other, other ways, either in post or with lighting or something like that. Um, the lenses aren't making any decisions for me. Um, I was really considering the Canons. Uh, it was between the Canon CNEs and these, um, and it came down to, to these guys because of their size, their versatility, um, their weight, and uh, again, they, I just really like them. <laughs> so uh, that's what brought me down to this. And, uh, you know, the Canons are kind of a dime a dozen. If I do have something, want to rent a Canon, they're all over the place. I don't see as many of these out there, but hopefully, um, you know, people will recognize these lenses. And I will be having them up for, for rental as, uh, as well. Um, locally only, please. Um, but I, I do rentals as well. And so these guys should potentially get some use even, uh, even when I don't have them slapped onto my camera rig. So that's another part of the investment um, is that I know that these can generate income even while I might not be personally shooting with them. Um, so another thing to think about, you know, Rental is always an option. There's definitely a lot of insurance and stuff you need to worry about to get yourself set up for rentals to be able to do it safely and protect yourself and protect your equipment. Um, but that is something that I do as well. And so these are also now uh, in my rental inventory, which will be a, a nice thing to have. All right, let's see what we've got. Okay, looks like we're winding down in the chat there. Uh, I think we covered just about everything, guys. I know that was a lot, um, and for some of you guys that may have been kind of redundant, you may have already known um, all about cinema lenses and what makes them cinema lenses, but hopefully coming by and checking out and just, you know, oogling over some gear for a little bit was fun for you. Um, and uh, I know it's fun for me. Like I said, I'm really happy to have these. Uh, I can't believe that I own these lenses. It has been a long time coming. Um, and uh, it's, you know, the culmination of years and years of work, and I plan on getting years and years of more work out of these guys. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping us up, guys. We're coming up on that one hour mark. Um, for those of you who are hanging out in the chat, I really appreciate it. Um, of course, we do these uh, every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Make sure you subscribe and click that notification bell so that in case you forget, you'll get that little alert letting you know that we are going live. Um, and we, uh, we get to hang out and check out cool stuff like this and cover different topics. Next week, like I said, um, I have moved the show about the 360 video editing to next week. So that is going to be on the 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so make sure you come on by and check that out. I've been playing a lot with 360 uh, footage and it should be pretty cool. Um, last but not least, guys, I didn't put purchase links or anything like that um, in today's show uh, because I don't think a lot of you guys are going to be going out after seeing this and jumping on B&H and ordering a brand new set of these or anything like that. Um, but if there is any other of my gear uh, that you are interested in what I use or what I recommend, down below I do have links uh, to an Amazon um, affiliate store that I have set up where I have lists of all the equipment that I use myself and that I recommend. So you can go in there and check out all the kits and lists that I have assembled and there's plenty of gear in there for you to check out. And it's all stuff that I have personally tried, used, and recommend for you guys. So make sure you go ahead and check that out. The last thing I want to say is if you guys want to hang out and interact with me beyond just the, uh, the live streams here on Saturdays, I have a Discord server down below, which is like a 24-7 chat server where you can reach me and various other people who are in the server to ask questions, share stuff, chat, hang out, whatever you want. Uh, so if you're interested in, uh, in connecting and building that community, go ahead and check that out down below. Let me see if we've got anything else here before I close us out. 
Um, let's see here. Trevor says, I wish you were set up to do a live feed through your Ursa uh, so we could see them in action. I am doing a live feed through my Ursa. The camera you look at me right now is the Ursa with the, uh, the 50 millimeter Rokinon Cine lens on it. Um, I considered I considered taking the uh, the 50 from this and putting it on there and shooting this show with it. Um, I thought I was going to have all of the lenses out a lot more. Um, turns out I didn't take the 50 out until the very end here, so I'm kind of regretting I could have put it on there. Um, but let me know in the comments, guys, uh, if you want to see some more in-depth tests on these, um, maybe some sharpness tests, uh, show you the lack of focus breathing. Uh, maybe I'll put together a, a little video where I actually do some testing on these lenses. Because to be honest, I really didn't find that much out there on these lenses. So it was my personal experience was the only reason that I knew how well these lenses performed and why I decided to pick them up. Um, so maybe if you guys are interested in seeing some, uh, some tests, some bokeh tests and, uh, and stuff like that on these lenses, um, let me know and I'll see if I can get that done and up on the channel so that you guys can scope them out whether you want to purchase them or maybe rent them for a project in the future. All right, let's see here. Trevor says, oh, <laughs> LOL. Yep, I am set up. I just didn't take advantage of that and put it on there. But who knows? Future live streams, I have a feeling, um, and videos, I have a feeling that these lenses are going to go onto uh, my Ursa and onto my GH5. So maybe you guys will see a, an optical quality increase on this channel very soon. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to get out of here and go enjoy my Saturday and let you guys do the same. Uh, but uh, thank you all for hanging out. And uh, if you're visiting after this live stream has ended, please pop any questions or comments down in the comments down below, and uh, I'll make sure to get back to you. And uh, if you want an immediate response, pop into the Discord. All right, guys, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next week when we uh, play with some 360 video, as, as promised, if I don't keep delaying it. <laughs> All right, guys, take care.